Okay, so this morning I'm going to talk about um, the kind of new way we've been introducing with Arno, but we're going to do statistics in EGLAM. And uh, so the way we want to do it is basically to analyze the whole space, uh, being channels or ICs, uh, but I'm going to focus on channels. Uh, to do that, we need, we need to account for multiple comparisons, obviously, since we're going to do loads and loads of statistical tests. And at the same time, uh, we use a hierarchical model, which means we can account for both the variance between trials and the variance between subjects, right? So what's the context? Uh, what, you know, for which reason we started to look at into uh, modeling EEG data this way? Uh, well, in terms of data collection, most of the time we've got loads of uh, data. Uh, the, the events are coming from all the brain for plenty of electrodes, quite relatively long period of times, well, at least with regards to neural uh, spiking. And most of the time we look where we see some signal and we do some simple analysis on a few channels or components. So the question was simply to say, well, maybe we are missing uh, the forest because we just you know, look at a, a given data point and we measure a peak or something like this. And by analyzing where we see an effect, we also increase our type 1 error. Because, you know, you just compute the difference across all the subjects, and you say, oh, look, it's around that electrodes on this IC, and that's therefore what I'm going to look at. It could be the next channel is actually who has the main effect. But the one you're looking at is driven by noise, and therefore that's the one you're looking at. So, you know, basically we have no good control um, to, to analyze the data unless you do a systematic search through the whole space. And so most often, we compute the average per condition. I mean, we do these statistics on the peaks. Uh, sometimes we also do peak latency or peak amplitudes. But at the same time, there is uh, multiple evidence, which is that the peak marks the end of the process. So something happens in the brain, the neurons are computing stuff, and then once we are at the peak, basically something else is taking place. So measuring the peak itself is actually not that useful, because it's what leads to the peak or what's leaving from the peak which matters, the peak itself is just the end of something. So measuring it is not that useful. So that's the kind of neurophysiological aspect. In terms of neurocognition, uh, people who've been using reverse correlation techniques also show that, for instance, I mean, we only shown it with faces, but it was pretty convincing uh, that if you look at the 170, um, which is a typical component for faces, this reflects the integration of visual facial features uh, which are relevant to the task, and again, the peak was marking the end of that process. So basically, you can see in experiments with faces, with different emotions, or things like that, uh, you can see the peak is shifting, but what, you can, what they show is that the peak is shifting by the way you integrate the information over time. So it's not the peak by itself which is interesting, it's actually when you go down to the peak. So now if you analyze all the electrodes, or all the channels, and all the time frames, but basically, we're going to look at to what leads to the peak, not necessarily look at the peak. And so to do that, we use uh, univariate methods, which extract information among the trials in time and or frequency across space. And of course, we can also use multivariate methods, which extract information across space, time, or both in single trials. So what I'm going to present today is what we developed for the univariate methods, even though multivariate methods are in the pipeline. And the reason why also we use uh, this kind of approach in which we do hierarchical model is that the average by itself, they don't account for the trial variability. And so that way, we can uh, not look just at fixed effect, but we can look at random effect. And so just to be clear about that specific aspect of fixed versus random versus mixed and hierarchical. So you probably heard all of these terms before, and they are except for fixed, but random, mixed, and hierarchical tends to be taken as similar, and they are quite similar, so I'm just going to clarify these concepts. And then we can move into how we model the subjects using hierarchical linear models. And then from there, I will dip uh, a little bit into uh, general linear models, show you a quick application for uh, EEG data, and then we'll get into multiple comparison corrections using Bootstrap. So again, going into the concept 
of how you can use Bootstrap to correct your statistics and how we apply it for clusters. Okay. Uh, before I start with these, if who's done some ephemeral stuff before? A few. So for those ones, hierarchical linear models, that's right, the typical fMRI stuff. Except in fMRI, we do it in time series here. We're going to do it across trials. So it's the same idea. OK, so let's clarify these different terms. So your fixed effect is something the experimenter directly manipulates. Right? So basically, that's what you're interested in. Typically, you're going to look at the effect of condition A versus B which corresponds to some cognitive or motor behavior. And the way you would model it with an equation would be to say this is the data y. And you need to find the coefficient beta for my effect, which is described by x plus some error term. Same as a regression, right? In your regression, you say this is the data. I've got my, my coefficient of regression beta. This is my effect, x, and my error term. You can also do it by having the constant subject effect. So same model, except that you have two constants, the error term and the subject effect. So in a random effect, what you want to do is to have, for instance, typically we would take u as being a random source of variation. So the individuals now are considered to be drawn at random from the population. And so that means that we're going to do something in the way we estimate the data so that this stuff, u, is not constant, which means all we're going to do is look at the effect, removing any variance that we have between subjects. Now, the other things that you can often hear or read in papers is mixed effect, uh, which is taken as similar as random effect most of the time, although this is not exactly true. Because the mixed effect, this includes both the fixed effect, so you estimate the population level coefficient, and your random effect, and so the model is this one, which means you have a coefficient as well for the subject. And basically, hierarchical models are simply a way we're going to look at mixed effect. So you can look at mixed effect using this big equation, or you have a simpler way to do it, in which we don't try to estimate the z value. What we do is we fit that model per subject, and that gets rid basically of this variance across subjects. So a hierarchical model is just a way to estimate your mixed model, and typically then we call that random effect. Okay, that's, that's how you can always hear about random effect, mixed effect, hierarchical model, taken one for the other, because they are related to each other. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, an illustration of this would be your fixed effect is your intra-subject variation. So this is your subject one, and of course we've got some variation, right? Because, well, from trial to trial, things are not the same. So if you estimate an effect here, we've got some variance around it, then same for subject two, three, four, and so on. And then if we look at this, I would subject that all of these subjects differ from zero, because of course they are quite away from zero, except maybe this one, so a bit of a variance. Uh, which cross zero, but at the random effect, all we do is we take the mean, for instance, which got this population, which means now we have a new distribution, and that distribution tells you there's no effect across all the subjects. Okay, that's just as simple as that, the way you make your random effect model. Whereas in your mixed model, you will simultaneously estimate the variance there, and this variance across subjects. Whereas in the hierarchical model, we just estimate per subject, get a result for subject and compute a new distribution across subjects, right? It's just the two different ways to estimate. And so under some assumptions, basically hierarchical model and mixed model give you exactly the same results. Okay, so the way we do it is a two-stage linear model. So you do a single subject. So for each subject, you will uh, take the EEG trials and you model them. And that'll give you one parameter estimate. That's your first level. Which basically means before what you are doing is for each subject, you compute an ERP. And then you do your statistics on the ERP. Now for each subject, we get parameters and we do the statistics on the parameters. Right? The only difference is your ERP 
doesn't account for trial variability. Whereas the parameters do. That's, you know, that's the trick. Otherwise, you can think exactly the same as, well, if I need six ERP, then I need six parameters. Right? So we just do the same, but except that we use models instead of averages. Now that we've got the single subject parameter estimates, or even a combination of those, then we can do the second level, which is the group analysis. And for a given effect, then the whole group is modeled, and we take those parameter estimates, and we do you know, a t-test, an ANOVA, whatever, on these parameter estimates, which is also a linear model. And so that's your uh, group level estimates. Uh, another illustration of this. So that's your fixed effect. Okay, so you measure something in time, and you've got some measurement error. So that's your variance over trials. So you've got like multiple trials, and then each time your waveform is changing a little bit because, well, obviously, this is different trial to trial. But you assume, that's why it's called the fixed effect, if you take an ERP, you average across all trial, that'll give you this black line, and you say, well, this is the truth. So that's why it's called fixed, because you say, well, the truth is fixed, doesn't move, but we've got some variance around it. And now we've got the random effect. So now we add another stuff which varies still around the truth, which is that some subject to subject, we also vary. So now we've got two sources of errors. As one is our measurement, which is still there, and we've got also from subject to subject where it varies as well. We're still interested in looking into the black one, but we need to find a way to model the red, that's the first level analysis, first subject, and then the green, that's your second level analysis. Again, that's just what's left from the subject variance. Okay, so here is another example. So it's a lot of examples for the same thing, but at least, you know, that's the key concept that you need to get today. Um, so here is another one where, so let's imagine a simple, you know, psychophysics experiment, and you present the stimuli, and what you do is, instead of having a fixed value, you just do it around the perceptual threshold. For, for each subject, you measure their perceptual threshold, and then you say, well, let's present from minus five units to plus five units. Okay, from each subject, everybody is different, so we just use perceptual threshold instead. And you measure reaction time. So tell me how fast you can detect something, given that I just vary around your threshold. So we expect a linear relationship, for instance. And this is what you observe. So this is subject one, and we go from minus five to plus five, and you know, that subject shows an increase of reaction time. Same for each subject. So each subject go a nice increase. So we're happy because this is what we get. When I increase the threshold, your action times get faster. Well, of course, because it's a perceptual threshold, so you discriminate faster, and then you can answer faster. So that's great. Now, how are we going to model this? Because, of course, now we've got these curves per subject, so there's plenty of ways you could do it. So if we start by a fixed effect, so the fixed effect would be like, the you know, stupidest way you would do it, nobody would do that, but you know, you would average over subjects. So instead of keeping this curve across subjects, you just take the plus five unit of each subject and you average. And so if you do that, so because now you're taking, oops, because now you're taking that point, you average with this one, this one, this one, this one. Then you take the other measurements, you average these ones, you average these ones, which means that the average curve, well, is this one. And this is the normality plot. That's not too good, but the, the residuals are not bad. And you see the residuals of the, is, is not too bad. But the data fit, yeah, is, is not good. But the residuals are actually not bad, and you've got a significant effect. You know, well, no, here, no negative effect on so that. It's not what you want, but, you know, that's your stupidest kind of way to do it. Another mixed ef fixed effect. So this time, you say, okay, I'm not going to average that way because that's a stupid way to average. So I'm averaging 
uh, with constant over subject. And so now the model goes something like this. So it's much better because it kind of go in the right direction. And we still have a nice normality plot. And so now we have a positive effect, but of course this is biased because we can see that you know, the model doesn't really fit all of the data. Now the other way is to use hierarchical linear model. So for each subject, you fit a curve, so a simple regression line. So now you have one beta coefficient for each subject, right? It's a simple regression. And you average this regression coefficient, which gives you the average regression coefficient, which gives you that line. Of course, now you've got residuals for each subject instead. So the model is a little bit more complicated, but we've got still positive effect, and now we have a good estimate of the truth, right? Because this reflects that line reflects much better what's going on across subjects. So it's just as simple as that, right? Instead of averaging with a constant across subject, we just do a simple regression per subject and average the regression coefficient. Now, if we were doing a mixed linear model, so two, uh, you can see not much difference between the two. And so this one I estimated all together at the same time rather than estimating separately per subject and averaging. But basically, the, uh, the maximum likelihood estimation gave me you know, pretty much the same coefficient. So that's what I'm saying. When the data behave as they should, basically mixed model, hierarchical model, not a big difference. And of course, it's much easier to use hierarchical model when you have big space of data. Here it's easy, it doesn't make any difference, but when you are looking at all the channels or all the components and all the time points or all the frequency and time points, well, you know, <laughs> that becomes computationally heavy. And so it's much easier to use hierarchical models. And so the way it's gonna look like is that you have your first level model for which we apply a GLM. So for each subject, now we've got these parameters Right, the same as before, you would have for each subject, you would have an ERP. Now you have a bunch of parameters. And then we put these ones at the second level for which we do uh, statistics. So the statistics that we have been implementing are called robust statistics. So I will come back to it in the afternoon. But basically, it's the same statistics as what you are used to. You know, you do a t-test, you do an ANOVA, you do a regression. The only difference is that they're robust, which means if you have one subject, which is a crap subject, you don't need to pretend that that guy doesn't exist. Those statistics account for it, right? Because yes, you did acquire 15 subjects. So the variance has to be estimated on 15 subjects, except that well, instead of using a mean, you use, for instance, a trim mean, which accounts for the fact that these guys, you know, these values are completely different from anybody else. So it's just statistics which allows to take care of outliers without pretending that these guys don't exist. And once we have that, so we're happy. We have a nice linear model, which means we account for within subject effect of the variance between trials. Then we can account for the variance between subjects. And on top of it, we account as well for you know, subjects which don't behave as they should, or at least not like the rest of the, of the group. But once we have that, now we have plenty of statistical tests, right? Because say you've done a t-test, so which means you got a t-test across 132 channels, all your time frame or all your time frame and frequencies. So we've got 100,000 t-tests. So if you set your type one error at 5%, well, you know, we have way too many false positives. And so the way we do that is that we're gonna use uh, cluster statistics and uh, something called TFC. And the way to do this is that you want to estimate what is the null distribution of clusters, same as, you know, under the null, this is my effect, where under the null, this is the size of a cluster, or this is a cluster mass, and my observed cluster mass is this value, therefore I can pre my data. So it's just a way to estimate clusters at the same time accounting for each cluster estimate. So we'll talk about this, and then uh, we'll get back to it again in the afternoon because that's, you know, something important. Um, do you have any question at this stage before I move on? Because uh, I'd rather do 
little breaks and questions in between. So we'll make sure it's clear. Yeah. If there are different observations by subject, do we have to model those as well? Uh, like different sessions? Yeah, well, you can basically, the, I mean, my experience is always to model as much as you can at the first level. Because there's nothing wrong by modeling plenty of things. And then if you're not interested in it, you can collapse across multiple conditions. So let's say you have 10 types of words, you model it. So you model a bit of that variance. And then you're like, well, finally, I don't really want to look at it. Well, you can basically use a contrast to average those 10 like you would have done with an ERP. But in your model, you did account for some of the variance in there. So if there is noise that cannot be accounted for, this will go in the error, which means your parameter, which, which, which is like your ERP, is cleaner, in a way, because you kind of remove the noise right, by modeling as much as you can at the first level. Yeah? What would be the columns of X? Whatever you like. So if you've got five conditions, then that's six columns, because you've got, the, you've got the, to model the error term, and the constant, sorry. Uh, basically, you need as many columns as you can have, as many columns as you want, minus one, compared to the number of observations. But of course, it's not a good idea to say, I've got 15 effects and 16 observations, right? <laughs> if you've got 15 effects and you don't basically one trial per effect, yeah, we can estimate it, but <laughs> it's the same as saying I'll do an ERP, but I don't have an ERP. I only have 16 trials. That's not going to be very good, right? You know that you need to put you know, 30, 50 trials together to get a decent ERP. It's the same idea. If you want a decent estimate of the effect, well, you need 30, 50 trials at least you know, to have something decent. <coughs> okay? Five minutes for... And uh, no. Arnaud said we have more time. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Basically, double the time. Because okay. Arnaud is not talking, so I'm doing the whole thing. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's, let's go a little bit into, so to answer your question <coughs> further, what's the columns of X? Well, let's get into the GLM a little bit further. So, I put reminder because some of you might know about general linear models, some might not. Um, so the best way I always find to describe what the general linear model is to start by the simply what it means. So the triverse, right? So we start by model. So it's a model because what you do is you assign to the data different effect of conditions, right? You're saying Whose trials are condition A, whose trials are condition B, whose trials are condition C. Well, you can say that's a model. It's a model of your observations. Uh, it's linear. That means the way we make that model to fit the data is that we consider that the output of that model has to satisfy two criteria, which are scaling and additivity. So which means you need to add things together, keep adding things together. Right? So that should be OK for most of us to do addition and multiplication. And so a linear regression is a linear model, right? Fraction times equal three times uh, your acuity plus two times vigilance plus some error term. You multiply stuff and you add stuff. That's linear. And why is it general? Why well, it is general? Because the GLM applies to pretty much all the stats that you know about. T-test, ANOVA, regressions, MONCOVA, whatever. And that's why this new way that uh, we have implemented in EGLAB is more flexible, because you can do any <coughs> design that you like, with as many conditions and covariates and anything you can think about, you can model it now with your EEG design, because we use a GLM. And you can extend it, uh, so from ordinary least squares to weighted least square, and then you can use generalized mixed model using, for instance, link functions. Um, and so the, I just added, like, before the talk, a little slide. 
on uh, GLM family uh, from Tor. So it's basically the way we can think of all of this GLM stuff is that you have t-test and simple regressions which forms a very restrained class of GLM next to another multiple regressions. They are all solved the same way. Then this, this goes into a bigger family with general linear models with mixed effects and higher frequent model, time series, robust regression, and also penalized regression, such as Rich and Lasso. I mean, all of this is within another bigger family that we call generalized linear models. So it's like if you can solve anything with generalized linear models, then you can solve everything else. It's just the other ones are specific cases. So we tend to teach people equations related to t-test, but basically if you know the equation related to GLM, then you can do all of them, rather than looking at specific equations. So our GLM will be the data and trials. So that's the simple way to represent it with only one time, one time frame, for instance. And then you will say, well, of course, for my n trials, I've got p effects. So let's say three conditions. Then I need to find the three coefficients, which means basically I'm going to multiply this and add them and my error term, which is written like this in terms of equations. And the assumption is about the normality of the error term, which is centered on zero with a given uh, covariance. And so we can estimate using ordinary or weighted least squares. So the default now is to use weighted least squares, which means basically, in addition of accounting for trial variability, you're also looking into the residuals. If some trials really are a very weird time course, for instance, or a very weird spectrum, then those are weighted down. So they are not removed, they simply have a smaller weight. And so all of these are always assumptions about your error term. And so that's uh, the main things I'm interested in these days is looking at errors. And so <clears throat> here's just an example we're gonna go through this afternoon. Uh, just to show what kind of, you know, what you can do with general, uh, with GLM and with a two, uh, with a hierarchical linear approach. And why it's m way more flexible than what you can do otherwise. So in this experiment, uh, we had 18 subjects and it's a simple task. You ask subject, is it phase one or is it phase two? Obviously, we are not interested in the phase difference. What we do is modulate the phase coherence of the image. So you take the image, you put it in Fourier space, you scramble the phase, you reconstruct it, right? Which means that image has the same amplitude spectrum as that image, except that, of course, the phase coherence is, you know, completely random. So you can can tell which phase it is. And so that's the, the basic stuff. And so the question we can ask is not anymore what's the difference between phases, but we can ask, how much does the phase coherence in an image influence your ERP? And not, instead of doing 10 categories, you can covary across 1,000 trials. You just assign random phase and you can do a linear regression per subject, right? Same as my little example earlier with regression time. We get the beta coefficient for regression and you just do a t-test across the subjects. And you can assess when in time and where in space the phase coherence of an image influenced your ERP. And so we got all the trials, you make your model. So again, same question as you were asking, how do you model GLM at first level? Well, here we put, even though we are not interested in phase one and two, it's in there. So maybe it explains some variance. So I still model it, phase one, phase two. I put my phase coherence. I've got my constant term. Now I can get my ERP for phase one, phase two, which don't differ. I can have my model for the phase coherence level. So across all trials, we can have a nice model in 3D of well, when the phase has the time, so when the phase is very big, we've got a very strong modulation. And that's my beta parameters, right? They look like ERPs, but they're not because they're like the ERP, but they're simply the parameter for phase one, phase two, the noise level, and the constant phase. And so you can see why it's 
in a GLM or in, in ANOVA when we call about variance analysis because you've got this constant term which looks like your ERP and we look at modulations around it. So all we are interested is the effect around the constant. So now we take those effects and the constant is this variance for each <coughs> subject because each subject has a different constant. Now we remove that, we just average parameters and therefore we subjects start to become random variable. And once you've done with your first, uh, first level analysis, you can do the analysis between subjects, so you've got a series of tests. As I was saying, they are all robust statistics. And so not only you can ask these kind of questions, but you can, do, you can go further. So in that experiment, the 18 subjects all have themselves different edges. So we have a parameter which reflects how phase coherence is modulated across trials. And now we can also regress on that regression coefficient the age of the subject. And what we see is that basically as you get older, then you take more time to iterate information of phase coherence across trials. Okay, so that's, you know, the first part, we've done HLM and now the GLM. Basically, you can model everything you want, right? Think of this here, of course, it's a question of interest, but you can also have all the stuff that you can't control, right? You have multiple stimuli, you can measure stuff on your stimuli that you couldn't manipulate across conditions, but you want to cover it out. So you say, well, I'm gonna look at the difference between condition one and two, but covering out some stuff I can measure across all my images, or all my sounds, or you know, whatever. So now you can cover out stuff that you can measure. You're like, okay, I'm not interested in it, but I know that's gonna influence my subject. So I can remove it. Right, you can either be the variable of interest or variable of no interest. Does that make sense? Questions before we move on? Yeah. Why all time points in, within each trial are like treated the same? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's a linear time invariant <laughs> model. So, so over time, you're not changing your model. So at some point, it doesn't fit. So you don't have any effect. But the minimum temporal unit is the single trial. No, the temporal unit is not, the trial is not model in time. The model is across trials. Right, but you're using the same beta essentially. No, no. No? The beta is changing. See, that's your beta. So this is your beta over time. So your beta is changing over time. Yeah, that's depending on conditions. Yes. That's why I, I did not understand either. So how, how do you get uh, the temporal resolution for the beta? So you run, you run, in theory, obviously, in terms of computation, we don't do it that way because that would be way too slow. <laughs> but in theory, it's the same as fitting the model for each time point, each channel, separately. In practice, of course, you just fit one big matrices and, you know, take bits of that matrix. But in theory, it's the same as just fitting the model over and over and over again. So if you've got 10,000, if you've got 100 time points, you fit it 100 times. And if you've got 10 electrodes, then you fit it 1,000 times. And you said this is a trial-wise um, GLM, but it has a um, you know, millisecond resolution in the beta. And how do you model the uh, uh, design matrix? So the design matrix is based on your experiment. It's got nothing to do with but the trials. the design matrix not for the trial-wise? Does the design matrix have a, a time point resolution? That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So the way we fit the model, so your question is about how do you what does the model do? So the model describes your experiment and it's fitted independently for each frame and electrodes. Each frame? And electrodes. So it's independent of the time course. Then the relationship between space and time is done next when we move into cluster statistics. So at this stage, you pretend everything is independent from each other except that actually in the weighted least square solution, we don't, because the weights are for a whole trial, like if the time course of a trial is different. 
but I'm not getting into this now. I will talk about that a little bit this afternoon. But uh, right now, you can consider that basically you apply the same. So you would have measured only one time point and one electrode that the model you apply. Everything is considered to be independent at this stage. Right? And that's why after that, that's why it's a mass univariate approach. Same as in fMRI. In fMRI, you model each voxel separately, right? It's the same model that you apply, but you do it for each voxel. Here, it's the same model that we apply for each cell of your you know, time frequency or frequency or time per channel. But, but in fMRI, you convolve the... Yes, here yeah, you don't. Right. Yeah. So, for instance, in SPM, they would have a hierarchical model, but they would use, uh, they would use sines and cosines to model the trial in time because they didn't want to rewrite our TLM, right? And so in SPM, basically, your trials are modeled in time. Here, we don't. Uh, it has some advantages that you, know, you can do more stuff that you cannot do if you model it as they do it in SPM. Uh, of course, computationally, Makoto, you can imagine that we don't do that because you know, it would take a big loop in MATLAB to say for every channel, every time point, every frequency, fit the model, you just have, you know, some, some sort of big matrices, fit everything at one time, and use some part of that matrix. So in your later presentations, did you show the comparison between uh, divine matrix used in SPM and this Uh No. No. We are not, I'm not showing any differences. There will be, for everybody interesting, you will see uh, next year, there will be a special issue in Frontiers where we all use the same data sets across different softwares, so you can see what each software can do and how much better each lab is. <laughs> okay? Right, so we can move on the, on the second part, which is now that we've done everything independently, we say, okay, we've got plenty of tests, and we consider them independently so far, but now we want to account for multiple comparisons. And I don't want to account it as a bonferroni correction, which I assume independence. I want to do it in a way where I know that things are correlated in space, in time, or in frequency. So for that, we're going to use cluster. But before going into cluster, you need to understand how we estimate the null distribution. And for that, we use bootstrap. OK, so little intermediate step. We go into bootstrap. Then from bootstrap, we can go into clusters. And so how does bootstrap work? Well, the central idea of bootstrap is simply to say that uh, sometimes it's better to draw conclusions about the characteristics of a population from your sample at hand rather than making perhaps unrealistic assumptions. Right? So typical things, we assume normality. Therefore, I can use the central limit theorem, and I can assume Gaussianity. And then I do my statistics based on this is normal data. Right? That's Basically, what is there for? Like, okay, just forget that, because maybe the data are not normal. Uh, so, the statistics typically would rely on an estimator, right? So, the mean. What we're going to use is trim mean, so we remove the bad guys, but that's just an estimator. You can use the median. Whatever statistics that you fancy, but typically that would be the mean. And then we measure also the accuracy of this estimator, right? Your standard error and your confidence interval. And so the bootstrap is simply a computer based method for assigning measures of accuracy to these estimates. And so it's a type of resampling procedure, same as jackknife, same as permutation. You know, it's basically we use a computer, we mash up the data, and we get some estimates out. And it's really useful to estimate bias, standard error, confidence interval, but you can also use it to estimate distribution. And so what's the way to do that? So that's the little recipe, uh, which is basically the percentile bootstrap. It's like the first type of bootstraps that people look at. There's other ways to do it. This afternoon I will describe, for instance, uh, how we use a Bayesian bootstrap, which gives you Bayesian confidence interval, which are a uh, more robust way to describe probability uh, of your estimates. 
But here, this is just the general idea of how it works. So you've got some data. So from 1 to 8, and you can see with different colors. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate a first bootstrap sample. So you sample the data. So you take some of these guys with replacements. Because what you're saying is, this is the, my population. The only way I can estimate my populations are these people that I measure. But maybe I could have two people with exactly the same value. So I can actually sample with replacement. And so you say, well, I'm going to take another bunch of eight, draw from these ones. And then that's my first sample. So now you can see I put twice number one, number two, three is gone, four, twice number five, six, seven is gone, and eight. So now I've got a new value. I mean, I can do that. Compute my estimate. So let's say a sum, or a mean, or a trim mean. And then I repeat that a thousand times. Then from that, I can compute basically the bias, the standard deviation. So let's say you compute a mean of your original data. You do a thousand mean. Now you've got the variations of the mean. You can estimate the confidence interval of the mean. So how do we do it for statistics? So here is, for instance, a two-sample t-test under the null hypothesis. So which is basically the standard way we do statistics, right? You do a t-test, and you say, you say, is it significant under the null hypothesis of no difference? So this is my group one. This is my group two. I get the mean and standard deviation. I compute my t-test. I've got my t-observed. Now I enter into my bootstrap loop. I get the data. Not I take the data, I resample from the center data, because this is under the null. So first thing I do, I take each group, I remove the mean. Now the group, for sure, they are not different. Right? If I center both groups, by definition, are the mean different? No, I just center it. So I know that A0 is true. Now I sample from the center data. I compute the mean, the standard deviation, I do my t-test, and I've got a t bootstrap under the null. Because I know it's true since I removed the mean of each sample. But now that since I resample from this, each time this is not always true, right? Because I resample. Sometimes I've got twice A, sometimes I've got twice uh, subject 2, subject 3. So which means from bootstrap to bootstrap, instead of being just 0, well, we oscillate around 0, depending on how the resample went. And I've got a t distribution, right? Because I've got a thousand t tests, which are the t distribution under the null, because I knew the data were definitely no difference between groups. And so, what's how do you get your p value? Well, how do we do p value usually? Well, usually we say, what's the p value of the sample? That's the probability of that my t value observed, observed t value is bigger than the t critical under the null. And that corresponds to the cumulative probability, right? So here I've got seven subjects. So the t distribution for seven subjects is this blue curve. My t observed, say, is there. I accumulate all of these values here. That's my p-value. And I consider it significant if it's above a given point on that curve, right? Now I can do just the same. So still the same probability, except that I'm not using the theoretical t distribution. I'm using the one I just computed myself under the null. So it's still the area under the curve, exactly the same as before. Now the significance, here you say, well, if I take 0.05 for, for a t distribution of seven subjects, that's 1.6 or something like this, around there. Well, here I can do the same. I can say, well, if I want 5%, I'll take the 95th percentile. So I can look at this. That corresponds to that point. And if the sum, if my t values are above this, this is significant. If my observed is above, is significant. If it's not, it's not significant. Why do we do this? Well, because now the theoretical assumed data normality, whereas here, the data can take any shape. The data don't need to be normal at all. Because you construct your own t distribution. Whereas this t distribution, 
is based on the central limit theorem, which says if you have a big sample, hey, this is how it behaves, because this is the normal curve in, in black. So we can do an approximation, right? That's the whole point, is that we always assume normality so we can approximate what the real value should be so we can derive a p-value. But if the data are not normal, this is completely wrong. If, you do, if your data are normal, this technique with bootstrap gives you exactly the same results as the theoretical distribution. The data are not normal, but of course now you're more accurate. Okay? So basically the bootstrap, if you do it under the null, is simply a way to estimate the distribution of your statistic, being a t value, f value, whatever. Based on the mean, the median, the trimming, whatever statistics that you use. Okay? Does that make sense? So now that we know how we do a bootstrap, how do we do that for EEG and do cluster business? So multiple comparison correction. Uh, so if you assume all the tests are independent from each other, so your family-wise error correction, so it's when you apply the same statistical test on a bunch of things at the same time, so it's a family of tests. The formula is one minus one minus alpha power of n, which n is the number of tests that we do. And so now if you say I'll put alpha 5%, so per usual, and we do uh, two tests, we should get about 9% of false positive. But that's why you always have to correct for multiple comparison, right? So if you do two t-tests, you divide k alpha by two, otherwise you've got 9%. If you, if you say I've got 126 electrodes, and I've got 90, 150 time frames, then we've got, oh crap, about 100% false positive, which means you have no idea which ones are your real effects and which ones are your false effects. Right, because it's an expectation. It's not like the true number of false positive. It's how much I can expect. So you can expect that if you observe something, you can expect everything is wrong, or maybe some are true, but you just have no way to know which one is which. And so just another illustration of this. Uh, here I just generate a random variable in MATLAB. You know, draw from n01. You repeat a thousand times and you measure your type one error rate. How many times you're significant? And so you can see each variab variable was around 5%. And then because it's a family wise, you just accumulate and you can see, you know, your type one error simply increases as you do more and more tests. So I'll take again this example of 126 electrodes and 150 time frames. So we've got 18,900 tests. And so I've got, for instance, that figure. So that's all the T, the T tests, all the T values. And if I apply 0.05 uncorrected, so I just say, okay, let's look at the p-values and show me where is under 0 0.05. That's all of these time frames in space. So here I plot the electrodes, I plot the time. This is also the topography at a given time point. And so basically, of course, we can intuitively, you're like, well, clearly that should be, you know, this stuff there should be true. So this kind of big patatoid there in the middle. And of course we know it's true, because we know that the EG on the scalp is correlated between electrodes, and we know that each time point is not independent from the next time point. And so we want, that's why we use cluster statistics, because then we can say, well, let's take this advantage that we know that things are correlated together in space, time, frequency. And so how do we do that? Uh, so we need to go back to this idea of family-wise error rate. So what's the family-wise error rate? That's the probability to make one or more type one error, right? One or more false positive. So it's important to get that idea of one or more. So the null is that there is no effect in any channel, any time, any frequency at all, right? So that means 
that if you reject a single bin, a single time frame, then basically this is equal to rejecting the null. Because we say that the type 1 error is the probability to make one or more. So if, as long as you just do one, that's it. You're doing the type 1 error. OK? And so what we want to do is to find a threshold u such as all my t values are above that threshold, and I do only 5% of error across the whole space, not for a given cell, for any frame, frequency, electrodes. So your bon Ferrani correction, as we know it, it's basically we take the 5% and we divide by the number of tests, right? Alpha divided by the number of tests that we do. And we can show you using the bool inequality that controls your family-wise error rate. So now if we go down to This one? Sure. Uh, so if we move to the maximum statistic, so again, you know, I'll go back to this one because it's important to get that idea. Family wise error rate is the probability of taking one or more, right? So how do we correct for multiple comparison when we use maximum statistics? So since your family-wise error is this probability to make any statistic bigger than your threshold, then this is also the probability to have that error for the maximum statistics. So what we want to do is instead of saying, well, let's control for the whole space, well, let's just control for the biggest value. Because if I control, since the type 1 error rate is any, then if I can control my maximum, obviously I'm going to control all the smaller values. So that's a way to cheat, to get to control your whole space, because now you're looking only at the maximum instead of looking at all of them. And that's because the definition of type 1 error is any, right, one or more. Well, I'm going to just use just one, but that one is the maximum. So if I control for the max, I control for everything else. And so that's the idea of using a hate threshold. So all we have to do is to find a threshold u such as the maximum only exceeds u 5% of the time. So I can have a distribution of maximum f value under the null. I'll take the data, I'll take my EEG data, I've got two conditions, I nullify them, right? I remove the mean. Now I know that this I0 is true. I bootstrap a thousand time, and at each bootstrap, instead of taking the whole space, I just take the biggest value. So now I have a simple distribution, which is the distribution of the biggest value. And I can say, well, show me the data where only 5% of the time I'm above that distribution of f values under the null. And that controls effectively for multiple comparison. Because now for the whole space, I will never get more than 5%, since I never have more than 5% for the max. So obviously, the ones which are lower than the mask, they can't make that error. <coughs> so to estimate the distribution under the null, we bootstrap. And we get this threshold. Now, if we do that, we still assume independence, right? So remember, you were asking me, how does the model work? And I said, well, we fit it independently for each time point. Now, if I bootstrap, I do it independently for each time point, I get the f. And it's still assuming that threshold is still correcting. So we can see that I got rid of plenty of little things around there. But that still assumes each time point and each frequency or each electrode is independent from each other. So the cluster is an alternative, which is more powerful, because it will account for topological features. Basically, you account for the fact that you know time, frequency, electrodes are correlated. And so we use a uh, typically cluster mass. And the clustering needs to consider these statistics. So you have cluster size. So how big is your cluster? You've got cluster height, or the strength, how big, you know, how, how sharp it is. And you've got cluster mass, which basically is just the sum of the values inside. 
So it's a way to have both the size and the strength together. And so if we do that, well, that's called spatial temporal clustering because we cluster in space and time, for instance, or you can do spatial spectral clustering. You know, you just adjust the name depending on what you want to, in which uh, type of data you're looking at. And we just do the same. So I've got the data. Now what I have is for each bootstrap, I can compute a cluster. So I say, well, if I threshold at 5%, I will have plenty of clusters. I compute the cluster mass, or size, or height, and I take the biggest. And then I do that a thousand times. So now it's not the distribution of max f value, but it's the distribution of biggest cluster, or biggest cluster mass. Now that I've got my biggest cluster mass, well, same as before, I say, well, I want 5%, so I look at the 95th percentile, and any of the observed clusters which are biggest by my 95th percentile under the null are significant clusters. And so now we can see that, you know, not much different from the max, except that we've got a little bit bigger there. And that, again, now, in a sense, we get more power, we see a bit more effects, because we account for spatiotemporal dependency. Now, this is very nice. But it has still have one issue, is that we have a loss of resolution. Uh, because your inference, so when you say this is significant, is about the cluster. So you don't cluster statistics, and you find three clusters. You can say nothing about that it is on a given channel, or at a given frequency, per se, or inside that cluster. Because your statistic is about the cluster, not about specific unit inside that cluster. So that's why you have a loss of resolution. Right? The inference is not about a particular data point. It's about a whole cluster. So it's still nice, because you, know, you can say, well, we have a first cluster which starts you know, at 150 milliseconds, followed by a second cluster after 200 milliseconds. Um, but you know, that's. I can't n not say really much about what's going on inside this big chunk. Well, I can say the max is there, but I can't really make an inference about that because my whole statistics is for the whole thing. And so the other solution that we have is that you can compute TFC, which is a threshold free cluster enhancement technique. Basically, it's cluster as well, but you integrate the mass uh, and so the TFC score uh, now reflects the values per cell. And so what it means, it means that you threshold plenty of times your data, so you've got plenty of clusters, and you integrate these values. And by doing this, now your inference is again per cell, but you have a, it's a support function, so which means that any values that you observe, your TFC score, so we have observed T values, and we transfer them in a score. And that score is basically the height, but weighted for, well, how much neighbors do I have? Because if you have, so the good point, the good side effect of this means if you have a single time frame on one channel which has a crazy F value, it would be significant, statistically speaking. But it's not significant in terms of inference, right? A single time frame on a single electrode in the middle of nowhere, poof, you have a spike, and it's significant. That doesn't mean anything. It's not going to happen. It doesn't exist for real, right? For real, you must have a little bit of dependency at least in time, because your statistic or your ERP difference is going to grow and then go back down. It's not like a sharp time point. And so that's what TFC does. It keeps this. And so if you have no neighbors, because you integrate, that value goes down. But if you have a big cluster, but small, small values, these values goes up. So your inference is still cell by cell, like when you do with maximum statistic, but somehow it accounts for the spatiotemporal dependency. And then the way we have the TFC scores. Now, since we have the null distribution, we can get the maximum TFC score under the null. We got a distribution, we look at the 95th percentile, and you threshold the data. Now I've got this map again, except that now I can say anything I want about a particular point, 
because now the inference is about specific cells and not about the whole cluster. So, to conclude, I have a selection of channel and frequency bins or time frame must be independent because we have good priors. Basically, we can analyze the whole space. So if you do have a previous experiment and you say, well, I know this is that component or this is that channel and that frequency bin or that time frame I'm in interested in, that's absolutely fine. Because you do your new experiment, you go to that place and you use your statistics. Now, if you acquire data, start to look at the difference and say, oh, I see an electrode there when there's some differences, I'm going to do a statistic on this. Well, you're likely to inflate your type 1 error rate. Because maybe the stats, the real effect is on the electrode next to it. But you're looking at the one which shows the biggest effect because it's driven by noise. But you don't know that. So unless you have good priors to select a given electrode, a given time frame, a given frequency, then basically you have to do the whole space. Now, good priors do exist because we do experiments and we repeat experiments. So we do an experiment and say, well, we know, I know this effect exists there. I can do a new one and look there. That's absolutely fine. But if you don't have that, then basically, if you want to have a good control of type 1 error, you have to go through whole space analysis. Uh, the amplitude and the peaks are related to each other, right? Because if I have a bigger amplitude, I will make longer to peak there. And so therefore, you don't really have reasons to you know, look at differences in terms of latency amplitude. You can just look at the whole space. Then we use a hierarchical linear model. And that means we can account for the variance across trials and the model, the, the subject, has random effect. And when I say we account for variance across trials, I mean by that, yes, we account for variance, variance trial to trial variability, but in your model, you can remember, account yourself for this variability. Right? You've got two types of images. You measure stuff on those images. So typically, say, you would want to control the luminance and you make all your images with the same luminance, well, instead, you could just live with natural images, measure the luminance, and enter the luminance as a covariate. Mathematically, it should have the same effect as controlling it a priori. I would always recommend to control a priori or stimuli, of course, but sometimes it's just simply not possible to control everything, because when we start to control everything, there's no more differences, right? But we can measure the difference and put it into the model. And once we have this, I uh, will use a robust GNM. I uh, will get into that a little bit this afternoon. So the GNM is not completely independent, really, because we look at um, how to weight the trials. And then we can assign any design and covariates. So Arnaud is going to talk about the study design. So we're going to give you the, uh, the beta version of uh, EEG Lab, and you will see uh, that study design has been completely changed. So in a way that once you get your conditions, you can model everything that you want, basically through a GLM, and then you do your second level statistics. Right, so we basically worked on this. Uh, so Ramon, that you can see sometimes on the GLAB list, you know, spend a lot of time with, with Arno rewriting this whole thing. Uh, we're gonna go through that this afternoon as well. And once we have that, we can do the group level statistics and look at clusters. And I will go through that again this afternoon. We'll have more time to compute some clusters so you can see what it is and then go back to the theory so that we can see you know, practically what the fines look like and what it means in terms of theory and relate the two together. And a couple of references. Okay, thank you.